Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Hanna van der Vlis. Um, I'm a data scientist at Apollo Agriculture. Um, and this talk, I won't pronounce the title because I'm not sure whether I'm allowed. Um, <laughs> but this talk is a practical guide to Bayesian hierarchical modeling in PyMC3. Um, PyMC4 is actually out. I haven't used it yet. So this is in PyMC3. Um, so if you want to learn about PyMC4, you probably should talk to Thomas. Um, so this is a practical guide because I studied statistics, um, but I only had frequent statistics, machine learning, um, I learned how to code. And then when I started this job slightly over a year ago, my manager, who's actually in the room right now, um, made me do Bayesian statistics. Um, so I get on the internet and try to learn Bayesian statistics, and it was hard. So um, this talk is for everybody who didn't study math, who doesn't know exactly what MCMC sampling is, who doesn't really know what a conjugate prior is, um, but still wants to do Bayesian statistics. So what is the minimum you need to know? Um, so I'm going to go through uh, a real world example that I encountered during my job. So I tell you a little bit more of what I do. Um, I work at Apollo Agriculture. It's a fintech. Uh, slash agritech company. Um, so when we started, our mission was to help uh, smallholder farmers become more profitable. Um, so we would give them good quality inputs, which is not always a guarantee in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, training, insurance, uh, access to the market. Um, but quickly we found out that uh, the biggest bottleneck for smallholder farmers was to get access to capital. So what, what our main product is now is that we uh, give farmers a loan, not in terms of money, but we give them seeds and fertilizer uh, to plant the next season with. Um, and after they harvest, they sell, uh, make a lot of profit and pay us back and have their own share. Um, right, so the real world example that I'm going to talk to you about is predicting yield. Um, by the way, these are all pictures I took myself in Kenya. Um, I thought they were beautiful, so I wanted to share with you. Um, so when you try, uh, when we try to predict yield, we use data that we collect in uh, our application survey. So when a farmer applies to our loan, uh, we call them and we ask them some questions. So we gather some data. Uh, we ask them, for example, about their last season. Um, so this is only about maize. So we will ask them, how many bags of maize did you harvest last year? And then we normalize that per acre. Um, and we have a bunch of predictor variables that we can use, uh, for example, which seeds and fertilizer they used, uh, what is their prior experience with farming, some demographic data, and their county, so where they are. Um, this model seems to predict pretty accurately. However, when we do some sanity checks, we see that there are regional clusters of high yields in a given season. Um, so, for example, uh, a county Wasangishu will have really high yields um, and county Embu and Meru have uh, really low yields. Now, these clusters are not consistent year over year. So maybe in the first year, um, this was the distribution of the yields, but in the next year, Embu and Meru actually had really good yields. Um, so if we were to use that uh, black box machine learning model and we didn't do the sanity checks, um, we might be surprised the next year. Um, this has probably something to do with rains. Like we're talking about maize yields here and the rains are very unpredictable, especially now with climate change. Um, so they change year over year. Even if we excluded uh, county or region as a variable in the model, the model still uh, predicted way higher yields for some counties than for others. So it found a way to still represent uh, this regionality. Um, so this is an example of hierarchical data. Um, so hierarchical data has something to do with the, da the way your data are gathered, usually. Um, so sometimes uh, you have different data sets studying the same thing, but they come from different studies. So the hierarchical layer would be the study. Um, in this example, the county is the hierarchical layer. So we expect uh, farmers within one county to be more correlated to each other than a farmer outside of the county. Um, so when you work with hierarchical data, you have a couple of options. So you can pull the data together, uh, put everything in a big um, chunk of data, and you can basically ignore that 
there is hierarchy. Um, it's not always a good idea because uh, you neglect important information that you do have. Um, and as you saw in my example, sometimes the, the model will find out um, that there is this hierarchical structure. Um, you can do an unpooled model, which means that you uh, make, in my example, that would be uh, 30 different models for all the 30 counties that we serve, um, and make it so make a different model per county. Uh, this also has a lot of downsides. Um, in our example, that would be 30 models, which is a lot of work. Um, some groups also might have very small sample sizes, and you're not learning maximally from the data that you have. So in hierarchical data, usually you have some shared parameters over counties, um, like the effect of uh, your prior experience with farming on your yield. It's probably shared across counties, uh, and then there are some distinct effects within a county that vary county by county, like the effect of rain. Um, so the other option you have is the hierarchical model, uh, which is the focus of, of my talk. And it's kind of a mixing of the two. Um, so in a hierarchical model, you can estimate to what extent um, groups look uh, are actually pooled versus different but you can also control to what extent you want them to be pooled or different so you can um, scale the group means towards the overall mean uh, to make them look more similar um, the downside of the hierarchical model is that it's pretty complex um, so i'm going to show you the simplest way to start getting into the super powerful technique um, we're going to do this with real-world data. So again, we're talking about maize yields. I only use three variables here for simplicity. Um, so in the county uh, variable, I have people's county, then the maize yield is bags of maize per acre, and then I have a Boolean variable, whether you used hybrid seeds or not. Uh, now, if you're not an agronomist, I'm, I'm not either, um, I'm going to tell you the basic thing. So hybrid seeds usually have a positive effect on yield. Um, which we see in our data. Um, so the farmers in our data set that use hybrid seeds have an average of 12 something uh, bags of maize per acre, and the farmers that didn't use hybrid seeds have an average of around eight. Um, then more descriptive statistics. Uh, the red bars here uh, only had one observation, so it didn't really make sense to plot. Uh, an error bar, uh, but here we have all the counties ordered on uh, yield, and on the y-axis you can see the yield. So what I'm trying to show here is the huge differences in yields per county. Um, and because of some small sample sizes, I plotted the error bars on there. Um, so as you may know, we're going to do all of this in the Bayesian framework. Why? Um, well, for one, it allows you to incorporate prior knowledge. Uh, we have a bunch of really smart agronomists uh, at Apollo, and so they know what are normal yields for smallholder farmers to get. Uh, we know that the yield can be negative. Um, so we can incorporate all of this knowledge to get more uh, statistical power. And the second thing, maybe most important thing, that uh, the, Bayesian, the Bayesian framework allows us to do is that we can model the outcome in terms of a probability distribution. So in frequentist statistics, we usually uh, work with maximum likelihood and we get this one estimate out of our model that we're interested in. So in my example, the parameter we're interested in might be the effect of hybrid seeds on your yield. Um, with frequentist sets, we will get one estimate. With in the Bayesian framework, we get a whole probability distribution, which means that you directly quantify your uncertainty, and which also means that if there are some uh, really unlikely values in your tails, but they are really crucial or dangerous or uh, expensive for the business, you want to know them. Um, okay, so how do we do Bayesian data analysis? This is from uh, Andrew Gelman's book. I see I forgot to reference, but now you know. Um, the Bayesian data analysis uh, is basically three steps. Uh, the first step might be the hardest one. So it's setting up the full probability model. So in Bayesian statistics, everything uh, has a probability distribution. So there are priors, there's your likelihood or observed data, 
and uh, there's your posterior. They all have a probability distribution that you need to think about. Um, and you need to set values for your priors, which I will come back to later. And you need to say what are the relationship between all of these probability distributions. Um, but no worries, because uh, you can just go through all the steps and then do it again if the model doesn't fit. So uh, we go to step two, we calculate the, and interpret the posterior distribution. Um, so this is the parameter you're interested in. So in my example, maybe the effect of hybrid seeds on yield. So we calculate the distribution um, and the expected value and what is the confidence interval around that value. Um, and this is all conditional, of course, on our prior and our observed data. And then we evaluate model fit. So the, this step is actually two steps. Um, so we want to evaluate whether the model converged. Um, and we want to evaluate whether the model seems to fit our data. Does it explain our variance? Does it make sense? Um, and then if it doesn't, you just go back to step one. So we're going to do all of this in PyMC3. Um, so PyMC3 uh, gives you this very intuitive syntax to describe your data generating process. Um, and I put that on the bottom. So uh, when I put some code examples up there, you know that PM is the PyMC3 package. Right, so some more prerequisites. Um, so my data is called data. Um, and I save a couple of things in a separate variable. So I have my counties. That's uh, a list with strings of all the county names of length 30. And counties is an integer uh, that's 30. Uh, then there's a county lookup. It's a dictionary from the county string to the integer. Um, then, yeah, then these below here are all of length 110,789. That's the length of my data. Um, so for every person in the data set, what is their county? What is their yield? And did they use hybrid seeds or not? Um, so hybrid seeds is a Boolean, where, uh, but I turn it into an integer. So the one means that you use hybrid seeds. Okay. Um, so we're going to start with a uh, pooled model so that I can uh, ease into the code and make it more complex from there. Uh, that is, I guess, my first practical tip. Start as simple as possible and uh, work up from there uh, because it can get pretty confusing. Um, so this is what the code looks like. Um, so the PM, as I said, is PyMC3. So you put everything kind of in this model container. That is why you use the with statement. Um, and then my, my second tip would be, uh, but this is very personal, um, go from the bottom up. So I like to look at what is my Y, uh, which in this case is maize yield, and what is its distribution. And then I know I see it's a normal distribution. Well. I define that it's a normal distribution um, with mu and sigma. And then I go up, what are my mu and sigma? Um, right, so I'm going to look at this a little more later. Uh, but this bottom um, argument, uh, pm.model2graphviz, gives me this beautiful plot that I butchered with colors. Um, so this is step one, setting up the probability model. Uh, on the left, I colored everything that is my observed data, um, just for, for clarity. And then I gave some labels to the numbers, so my observations and uh, hybrid seeds and non-hybrid seeds. So the observed data is on the left, and then the priors are on the right. Um, so I'm starting with the observed data. So I have to choose a distribution for my observed data. Uh, you can already see here that I chose a normal distribution. But then when we go back to the code, you see that I put in observed is log underscore maze yield. Um, so why did I do that? Um, choosing distributions. So uh, when I start choosing distributions, I see a lot of people talk about conjugate priors. And I was like, oh, what is a conjugate prior? So I found this um, really um, helpful question <laughs> um, that could have been written by me, honestly. Um, and the answer to that was basically 
uh, the conjugate prior has something to do with distribution families. So what we do in Bayesian stats is we multiply the, the prior with the likelihood and we get out the posterior distribution. So depending on the distribution family, um, the posterior distribution has a certain distribution. So if your prior is Ga Gaussian, which is the normal distribution, and your likelihood is Gaussian, your posterior will be Gaussian. So um, we want Gaussian. Also, I put this uh, blog post in here that's really nice. It has, um, for every prior and likelihood combination, it will tell you what your posterior will be. So you don't have to do the math by hand. Um, right, so this is what my data look like. And as you can see, it can't go uh, below zero because it's the yield and it has a long uh, right tail. So I think log distribution. So I take the log of that and I get this kind of normal distribution. Uh, this is a piece of code that I used to do that. I added 0 0.1 to it because you can take the log of zero. Right, um, so now I need to set my priors. Uh, so what are priors? Um, priors basically express our knowledge and also our uncertainty about theta. Theta is the parameter we're interested in, so it's the effect of hybrid seeds on the yield. Um, and it's uh, usually based on domain knowledge or on previous research. Um, or you can Google things and then come up with numbers that, that, that make sense to you. Um, so the prior distribution should probably include all plausible values of theta, um, but it doesn't necessarily need to be concentrated around the true value because the prior distribution is not the only thing we work with. Um, we also have a ton of observed data. Um, so the plausible values of theta for me, um, in, in because this theta is the mean of yield, uh, that changes that changes the situation a little bit. So what I know from maize, what I heard from, from my colleagues, uh, the yields can be negative, that's one. Um, for smallholder farmers in Kenya, uh, they can be zero, unfortunately. Um, they can maybe be 30 bags of maize per, per acre, but because these are means, uh, they won't be zero. The, that would be very unfortunate. So the probability that they're zero is really, really, really low to maybe non-existent. So I think the probability distribution is somewhere between five and 20. Um, we're working with logs. I'm not really good at thinking in log distributions. Um, so I think that probably my um, prior distribution should be centered around 10. So I take the log of 10, I make this distribution and it looks about right. Um, so in my case, I used domain knowledge um, to make this prior distribution. Um, and then I need to set a prior for my sigma. Um, so there's a couple of options. For one, uh, the sigma can't be negative. Um, so it needs to be like half Cauchy or half normal. Um, at least it needs to be cut off at zero. Um, half Cauchy is a weakly informative prior. Um, usually it's easy to look up some blog posts or look in some of Andrew Gelman's books where there are uh, lists of weekly informative priors and you can pick one of those and try it out. Um, so I gave it the scale parameter one, I plotted it and looked at it and looks good to me. So this is the probability model. Um, for the simplest model that there is, um, so what I'm doing here is I estimate two thetas. Uh, you can see that here. Theta is a seeds index. Seeds is, has the dimensions two because there's a, a hybrid seed and a non-hybrid seed. Um, and you can see that here in dimensions. So I'm getting two uh, posterior distributions back. Um, so now I'm gonna uh, calculate them and step two and three come at the same time. So to interpret the posterior distribution, so what I see here on the x-axis is hybrid seeds is true or false. So these, um, this is my expected value, this blue line. Um, so the expected value, uh, the expected yield when you have hybrid seeds or not have hybrid seeds, um, it's, it's expected to be a positive influence. So having hybrid seeds leads to higher yields. 
that makes sense. Um, then the big yellow band is the expected distribution of your observations. Um, and the blue dots are my actual observations. So to evaluate model fit, the, what I immediately think is, well, a lot of my observations are outside the expected distribution. Um, so it seems like uh, having hybrid seats or not explains quite a lot of variance, um, which is indicated by this big yellow band, but also doesn't explain all of this variance. And when we think back about uh, the histograms that I showed in the beginning, we know that the county uh, makes a really big difference um, in yield. So maybe we can explain some more variance by including our county variable. So that brings us to the unpooled model. Um, so the unpooled model, again, is where you split your data set, in this case, in 30 different little data sets. You make 30 models, but we can do it in one go. So this is what it'll look like. Um, so what changed? I added uh, the county here. So for every person now, I know what their yield is, whether they use a hybrid seed or not, and what their county is. Um, and I'm going to estimate not two thetas, but 30 times two thetas. Um, so I will get the hybrid seed is true and the hybrid seed is false, uh, posterior distribution uh, for every county. Important to note is again that if I am calculating this for county Wasingishu, for example, I don't know anything about the other counties or the observations in the other counties. So they're truly independent uh, models or posterior distributions. Um, this is what changed in code. Uh, so I gave it just an extra dimension which makes, it, which makes it 30 times two. And you can see the same thing here where I now have county and hybrid seeds. Um, so this is the setting up the probability model for, for this model. Um, then step two and three come at the same time again. So to interpret the posterior distribution, well, you have to interpret 60 posterior, so that's a lot of work. Um, so I'm immediately going to uh, evaluate the model fit. So I just plotted uh, six counties here. Um, these uh, points are the expected value. The thick line is the 94% HDI around that value. And the thin line is the expected distribution of observations. Um, so I only put six counties in here. Um, so there are counties where the yield with hybrid seeds is actually lower than without hybrid seeds. So this is, this is an example. Um, you can see from, from the uh, big interval that it probably doesn't have a lot of observations in there. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, however, this is, this is pretty dumb because we know that hybrid seeds almost always or always has a positive effect on your yield. We have the data to prove it, but we're not using it. We're only using the data from this one group. And so for this group, we would say the effect of hybrid seeds is negative. Um, the other problem is there are counties where the difference in yield uh, between hybrid and non-hybrid is way higher than in other groups. So as you can see, the difference between those estimates um, is pretty big, while in a lot of other counties it's, it's much smaller. Um, again, we're not using our data maximally. We know from other counties that the difference is not that big, uh, but we're not using that information. And then the third more obvious problem is that we have a lot, and there are a lot more um, if we look at all the counties, we have a lot of counties with big uncertainty due to a small sample size, but we have a big sample size. Right, so that brings us to the hierarchical model. Um, so we start with step one again, we set up the full probability model. Now it became really complex all of a sudden. Uh, right, so I have this normal distribution again, um, and now three things are pointing arrows to there. So what is my mu and my sigma? Um, to me, it's not immediately apparent from here, so I will show you in the next slide what it looks like in, in code. Uh, but what I want to show here is that uh, in this model, what I'm doing is I'm estimating 30 different intercepts. So they basically mean what is uh, a county's base yield without using hybrid seed, and that is a different value for each county. Um, 
and the, they come from the same normal distribution with uh, the mu and the, the sigma. Um, so what that looks like in code, here you see the formula uh, that I was referring to. So now you know how those three arrows relate to each other. So we have 30 different intercepts, so depending on which county you're in, uh, you have your intercept, and then we have one common slope. Uh, we don't have to have one common slope, we could have 30 different slopes, but it would become a little complex for this presentation. So we have one common slope. Um, right, and then the other thing that I want to show is this sigma is basically your control parameter. So if this sigma was zero, um, that would mean that all the intercepts are the same. There's no difference between counties. So we could tell the model that we want that. Uh, if this sigma approaches infinity, uh, that means that all the county intercepts are totally unrelated. Um, so you could control this parameter. Uh, for now, I wanted to set a kind of reasonable value to let the model estimate that parameter for itself. Um, yes, so we're going to go to the next step. Um, step two, interpret the posterior distribution. So I'm only going to interpret the posterior for B, which is my common slope. Um, right, so we see this is what a posterior distribution looks like. Uh, we see a value 0 0.44, doesn't really mean that much to me. Um, but the first thing that I see is that the 94% uh, HDI is pretty narrow. So we're relatively confident in this, in this number. Uh, and it's positive, so the effect of hybrid seeds is positive. Um, and then, because this is on a log distribution, we uh, take the exponential, 0 0.44, and we get 1.6. So 1.6 is uh, a relative effect. So the way you need to interpret that is, uh, depending on your county, you have an intercept. Uh, so say that my intercept is um, five bags of maize. So without using hybrid seeds, I will probably get five bags of maize per acre. Then I multiply that number by 1.6 to get the estimate for when I do use hybrid seeds. So to get the actual numbers of estimated yield, we need to do a posterior predictive check, which then looks like this. So we have 30 different estimates for the intercept. Um, some of them way lower than others. Um, and then we have we plot the, the slope in here. So it's basically the intercept multiplied by 1.6 to get the uh, hybrid seeds is true. Um, so to take a step back, uh, I want to compare the three uh, methods that we have. Um, so the the three methods, no pooling, complete pooling, and the hierarchical model. Uh, up top, you see two counties that have uh, only a couple of observations. So the left county, um, Tharakanithi, only has two observations. And so that means that in the no pooling one, uh, it will just kind of draw a line from observation one to observation two. Um, the complete pooling line is the same for every plot because county is not taken into account. Um, so what you usually see is that um, the hierarchical model line is kind of an in-between be uh, between complete pooling and a no pooling version because it shrinks your group mean towards the, so the county mean towards the country mean. Um, so this is a nice visualization to see that effect. Um, and as you can see, for counties that have more observations, the difference between no pooling and a hierarchical model is not that big. So the more observations you have, the more the model will trust on the group mean. Uh, and that obviously also depends on the priors you set. Um, so what else can we do to make this more complex and uh, make a better model? Uh, we can add varying slopes. Um, so a different slope per county, and we can add correlations between intercepts and slopes. Um, so that would mean, which I think is a pretty reasonable statement, is, uh, for example, if you have really unfertile ground, you can put a hybrid seed in there, but it's still not going to give you a lot of maize. 
Um, so we probably think that if your intercept is really low, your slope is also lower. And if your intercept is really high, your slope might also be higher. I didn't test this, it's just speculation. So we could do that. Uh, we can add more predictor variables to explain for more variance, add more complexity in the model. Uh, if we have data from multiple seasons, we can add another hierarchical layer for a season. Uh, we could estimate what the extent, to what extent uh, yields actually differ season to season, but also uh, how that differs per, per county. So in some counties you might see really big seasonal effects and in some counties we don't. Um, so these are all possibilities. Um, these are my, uh, some of my references. I don't think this is really complete. Um, <laughs> on top is the, the stack exchange question that I showed um, that I think also links to a, uh, a blog post that shows prior and uh, posterior distribution, or like the, um, what are the conjugate priors for uh, certain likelihoods. Um, this is the docs from PyMC, uh, an example of uh, with radon estimates where they go through a hierarchical model. It kind of uh, goes through the same steps as I did. Well, that's no coincidence because I followed the blog post. Um, this is Thomas's website, it was right there. Um, he has a lot of super useful blog posts on uh, Bayesian modeling and Bayesian hierarchical modeling that I used a lot. And this training, I didn't actually do. I heard about it uh, on Friday uh, in the workshop, in Chris's workshop uh, on Bayesian modeling. So it looks really interesting. You might want to do it. Um, we're hiring. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Thank you very much, Hannah. That was lovely and clear. Yes, we do have time for questions. Who has a question for Hannah? Lovely. I'll start at the front here. There we go. So, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I was wondering if you think that adding correla spatial correlation between the different counties could have been something that might have helped the estimation in this case. Yeah, I think I actually um, talked about that with Thomas on Friday. Um, the hard thing about the spatial correlations is that sometimes they're, uh, or at least in Kenya because of um, mountain ranges, usually uh, counties that are adjacent to each other have similar range, but then all of a sudden there can be this like cutoff and then people on one side of the mountain have the rain and on the other side they don't. So I think it's completely possible, it's just a little harder than at, than at first sight, <laughs> yeah. Another question for Hannah, there we go. Yeah, thank you very much, it's really interesting. Um, I've got a lot of questions, but I'm gonna put only one forward. Um, um, why did you not maybe approach it using some experimentation, uh, like in terms of understanding the, the, this hybrid seed or not? Or did you maybe try um, and it wasn't successful? Um, so you mean like putting people in different groups and giving them hybrid seeds or not? Correct. Yeah. So I think the, n the nice thing about uh, Bayesian hierarchical modeling is that obviously it's the best to do experimentation, but it is also the most expensive and the hardest. And so even though um, I didn't make experimental groups, and this is all observed data, um, because we have these uh, uncertainty estimates, um, I think it gives a very good estimate of what could have happened when you did do an experiment. So it's kind of like, if you can't, if you're not, if you don't live in the ideal world, um, how can you still make sense of your data? I love you. One last question we'll take over here. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I would like to know how do you decide between what distributions to use? Because here in the case you use Cauchy, but I can assume that sometimes you might want to add the time, the time, uh, a time component, so maybe Poisson might be a little bit more appropriate. When would you use one over the other? Um, is this just by experimenting, or is it something that uh, as an intuition of seeing the data? Yeah, um, so I think for observed data, you usually think about what is this, the, the structure of your data. Um, so um, if your outcome would be like 
or if, or if your observed data would be this experiment with true or false and or, or counts, you might use binomial data or Poisson uh, data uh, distribution. Um, since you mentioned the half Cauchy distribution, this is actually something I struggle with, uh, giving the sigma a, a distribution. And I heard from Thomas that the half Cauchy is actually not that um, useful to use any or anymore, maybe, um, because it has a long tail, so it's harder to estimate. So he uses a half normal distribution. Um, so for the sigma, the only things that I know is that I want it to be positive and what, what do I think are like probable values. But apparently having a really long tail makes estimation time really long and sometimes then models don't converge. Um, so it's actually good that you asked. Should have probably said that. Lovely. Well, thank you ever so much for your questions. Hannah, are you around later to answer more questions? Yeah. People have them. Perfect. Yeah. Another round of applause for our speaker. Yeah.